Hey, and welcome back to another exciting episode of Extra Feature. Today I have one of my favorite guests, he's Canadian, so you can't go wrong there. His new movie, The Movie Goer, I don't know where it is you can find it, but he'll tell us later, I'm sure. Ross Monroe, welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me. Great to be here. So what have you been doing for, it was been two years probably, I think. Yeah, it's been a few years. Well, you know, we've, uh, believe it or not, I mean, we, we my uh, wife, Maria, who is also our, our, the producer of our films, and amongst other things, we've just been, we've been working like it's, uh, you know, we had to get things up and up and running with COVID kind of settling down. And now people were able to get back into their uh, cast and crew back to normal a little bit. So. Um, so we had to kind of wait on that a little bit to, you know, now things are, I'm, I'm in Vancouver here. So, you know, film productions, you know, obviously got rolling pretty fast because there's a lot of film production here. So, um, so then we didn't waste any time, you know, getting our crew together. And even though this new film, the movie gore, it's a short documentary. Um, you know, we still had to film a lot of scenes in terms of we had to, we did, uh, bring in actors and crew. We had to recreate some things to, to, we're, we're basically the premise of the film is we're trying to recreate my own experiences as a nine-year-old growing up in the early 70s when I would go to movies on a typical Saturday afternoon. So we ended up recreating what it would, a comic version, a comical version of what it would look be like for me to sit in a movie theater watching trailers and coming as attractions, all that stuff. And so uh, the whole experience of what it was like to see a movie in the early 70s. So we've been busy just doing that and now, of course, submitting the film festivals. We just played a really good film festival, American Documentary Film Festival. We premiered our film just like less than two weeks ago in Palm Springs. Uh, it's a great festival. It's an Oscar qualifying festival. So we we're really happy to be part of that. And then we've got some other screenings coming up theatrically across North America. So we're excited about that. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. Can Are we going to ruin any of this at the beginning or should I just pretend I don't want to ruin the end? ruin the end no i don't think you're gonna i don't think you can ruin anything like uh, okay no, I that i can it. discuss freely why base this on the person you base this film on there we go i'll do it that way uh well i think yeah i think i know what you're referring to you're right there is a little bit of a twist and a little bit of something so yeah we'll keep that but i will say this that um when i was nine years old and i went to the movies starting in 1972 uh i was a uh, crazy passionate movie gore i had a huge crush on raquel welch that's what i thought because you kind of pulled from yeah. the kansas city bomber that's right so i had a huge crush on her so uh that was one of the movies i saw in 1972 was kansas city bomber and i always remember that movie for those that may or may not know i mean uh it's a movie where raquel plays a um a roller derby star up and coming star in the hard scrabble world of uh, roller derby. Um, so uh, I always remember that movie and I love that movie. And uh, but we were going to actually feature that movie in our film itself and do a little profile on Raquel Walsh, showing how much I, I was in, you know, had a crush on her. But then when we started digging behind the scenes, we realized it was going to be very expensive like crazy expensive to get clips and to show trailers and any kind of photos of Raquel Welch. So then we thought, okay, we, we let's, let's do more like an homage to her, but maybe based on sort of a fictitious more version of her. But for people that might have a sense of movies from the seventies, they might start figuring out maybe this is sort of, this is an homage on Raquel Welch, who by the way, passed away not that long ago. So, it's a very. It was very sad to hear about that, um, but like I said, uh, luckily with our movie, I mean, like we were able to sort of memorialize like how much of a big place she had in my heart. So, I mean, for what it's worth, like I'm, I'm glad we were able to, you know, really like create a tribute for her, and um, you know, so, but uh, so yeah, so that's why we kind of had to do a 180, and we had to just create a persona that was similar to Raquel Walsh, with hopefully that with a bit of a wink and nod to the audience that they would figure out that this was an homage to Raquel Welch. Well, I knew as soon as you had the Kansas City bomber shot up, I'm like, I know it is. And plus yeah. the beginning of the, her career kind of get away. So use a lot of artifacts in this film. Like you find artifacts around your home, I presume, or maybe a storage locker you have, or 
Maybe someplace else. So where'd you find the artifacts used for the film? Well, we, I mean, in terms of costumes, I know, uh, I know Maria built all the costumes and designed all the costumes because uh, I know we had to recreate a, a 70s steward, stewardess movie and Maria designed all, all the costumes for the stewardess to try to give them that early 70s look and, and even, and then, and then we have to have some stuff from the early 70s. So we did uh, through costumes and props and we had to recreate also some uh, you know like some early early 70s movies as well and look so we did actually use we went to a prop house we did get a lot of actual like you know we have, they have large movie prop houses here in Vancouver for the massive productions that they have here so uh, whatever we couldn't just didn't have or couldn't grab a thrift store we did get some stuff at thrift stores too but Maria is good at looking around that. She's also the production designer and costume designer, but we did have to go to a prop house and get some things at prop houses too, like old telephones, you know, like just like you say, old artifacts, uh, different things that we needed. So yeah, that, that was a lot of work trying to, you know, for a 19 minute movie, we really packed in a lot of like early seventies representation in terms of costumes, props, everything. Yeah. Music. Okay. I want to go to a few more things. You had photos of a certain individual and also a beauty pageant of a certain individual. I was more interested in where that came from too. Yeah. The, the, the persona that we created is sort of as this, uh, uh, Raquel Welch substitute was someone that, uh, those are actual pictures of that person who actually grew up, uh, in South America, uh, and, and entered beauty pageants when she was a late teenager, early young adult. And so all the photos that you do see, uh, we are representing them as a uh, famous uh, actress from South America, who's, uh, whose rise to stardom was very similar to that of Raquel Welch. And that was actually a real person that I, anyone that sees the movie, they'll know that that was a real person that I know quite well and uh was able to, to really use all those actual photos and and uh, of that person growing up so we were able to create a whole uh history of a person uh of their success as a model and actress using actual uh authentic photographs from their life so did that help you to write this i mean obviously it's your personal part of your life and part of this person's life did that help you write it it was more personal story or when you were have a genesis the idea was always about your life and this sort of worked into it later yeah it was like you know it was always going to be about all these things how it affected my life you know growing up loving movies and how eventually it you know sprouted into my you know eventually into my interest and love of making movies as i got older and older but um yeah, I mean, again, like I was going to really incorporate, you know, the whole thing about Raquel Welch. And then we had to. And then once I knew I could use this person that I knew and I had all this access, like I really looked at all the access of all the photographs and authentic photographs they had. Basically mirroring all aspects of their life, then I just took all of that and I created a whole story based on all the photographs that I had. So I really. You know, I had the idea of, you know, creating a montage showing a, a, of a person's career as it started from South America, starting with modeling and then getting to movies and getting famous in North America. But I was able to use all the actual photographs that and then build the whole backstory around the actual photographs. OK, now you have a lot of animation here. Did you do it yourself or did you farm it out? Yeah, we have an animator that now, this is like our, uh, this is our second film now. Our last uh, short documentary, European Tour 73, we worked with a Vancouver animator named uh, Dylan Moore, and he did great animation in that. And so we we knew all along that this film, The Movie Girl, was going to be a real mix uh, and a variety of live action, stock footage, photographs, super original Super 8 millimeter photographs. Uh, film footage, home footage, and we knew animation as well. We were going to incorporate the animation, so <clears throat> so we used uh, Dylan, who again he's a uh, quite a, a famous local animator here in Vancouver, and 
again, really happy with the results. And we just wanted to mix all that animation in with everything else. And it just, it just creates a lot of variety, it creates a lot of texture in the film to just have all these different styles of visuals in the film. So we were very happy to work with him. Okay. Did you really go to the movies every Saturday without fail? Yeah, I really did go every Saturday. I mean, even like I grew up in Winnipeg and uh, in the winters there, I don't know if anybody realized they're like super cold. And uh, yeah, I mean, I would take a bus and it could, I'd be standing at a bus stop, you know, it'd be like super freezing and I would just be, it'd be a Saturday. And usually what I had to do, especially in the winter was I usually played hockey in the mornings. I have a really early morning hockey game, usually outside as well, freezing. And then come home, and I remember even just playing hockey, it'd be maybe nine in the morning, thinking like, okay, I gotta get home and get changed, and then catch that bus because there's a, a there's like the new Raquel Welch movies playing at noon, so I gotta get on the bus by eleven so I can make it. And you know, of course, back then, you know, I would just show up at a movie if I was ten minutes late, I'd just walk in the movie. I don't care if the movie had started ten minutes, I would just stay for the next screening and watch watch it all over again anyway. So it didn't matter. I just catch those two minutes on the flip side. So. I didn't care, but uh, yeah, like every Saturday, I mean, the only time I didn't go is if I was grounded. You know, like if I, if I did something wrong, my parents knew that my Achilles heel, if I was doing something wrong, I didn't do my chores or I'd, they'd be like, oh, maybe there's no movie this Saturday. So they knew that they could get to me like that. So Now, when you went to the movie theaters, I mean, it's 1972, you're a very young child. Did no problems? Like, did you really have to get people to buy you tickets? So you really didn't check the paper to see what was out? I checked the paper to see what was out. But what happened was sometimes when I go downtown and I walk around and see all my favorite movie theaters and just, you know, just kind of, I just like, even though I knew what movies were playing in all the theaters, because I would read the paper, the newspaper, or the movie section, but I still go there because I like to look at the posters and the lobby cards that they would have in the, you know, on display. But every once in a while, you know, if it was a movie, for instance, I was restricted, I would still try. I'd say, you know what, maybe I'll just wait here for 10 minutes and maybe I'll get really lucky and I'll get somebody to pose as one of my parents and bring me into the movie. So I would try that sometimes. It was more like just more like I was, if it was spontaneous, I'd be looking at the lobby card, say, for like the longest yard or something with Burt Reynolds. And if it was restricted, of course, I couldn't get into it without a parent. But while I was looking at the lobby card, suddenly if like just like a, uh, you know, a gentleman would walk up about to pay. I'd just be spontaneous, go like, oh, excuse me. You think you could bring me in? And I really want to see this movie and just pretend you're my dad. And oddly enough, some people said yes. So yeah. it was like, oh, cool. <clears throat> you know, and it didn't always work because sometimes a lady at the box office would look at the person and go like, how is this 25-year-old guy your dad, right? Like, ah, I'm not buying yeah. that kind of thing. So what movies did you not get to see then? Or do you remember any of them? Oh, yeah. I remember like as a kid, like starting around 1972 and I was just really obsessed with movies. I can remember I was really dying to see Deliverance, The Godfather, Clockwork Orange. Like I couldn't see any of those movies because they were always written. And of course, in 1973, the big movie that everybody talked about that was supposed to be so shocking was The Exorcist. And I can remember like, oh, my God, that was a like movie like I kept hearing about that people were passing out and they had, they had to hand out Bibles in the lobby. And I kept thinking, oh, my God. Uh, like I got to see this like but I never but again I could not you know like I just could not go see those movies so there were those movies that I remember thinking like wow those are movies I have to wait till I'm like 18 to go see you know what I mean okay now I have a question you had no chance to see the Godfather and Clockwork Orange which you've told us when did you see them I mean you got to wait for either a re-release I mean do they play them on television in the 70s I don't even know I've been too young to remember Sometimes they would show a famous movie from the 70s, like maybe, you know, five, six years later, but they'd be so super heavily edited because all we have is the three networks, right? We just had our ABC, CBS, and say the CBS Saturday Night Movie, The Godfather, viewer discretion is advised. You know, they just chop it all up anyways, right? Like it wasn't even like so. But I had to wait till I was about uh, 16 because I had an older brother and he turned who was two years older than me when his when he turned 18 then I could use his ID because uh back then you didn't have picture ID it was just a birth certificate just had the information of your birth and all that so I had to wait till he was 18 as soon as he was 18 then I was 16 and I could take his ID he would lend it to me and then I could then when they brought Clockwork Orange and the Exorcist back say 
you know, in the, say the early 80s, when I was in my last year of high school, they had some repertory theaters where they would bring those movies back. Then I could use the fake ID and go see Clockwork Orange and The Godfather and all that and, and Last Tango in Paris and all that, um, you know, because I had that that fake ID. So uh, and this, of course, this is well before, you know, VHS and video, too. So there was no that was the only way you could ever see a movie again pretty well in its entirety uncut is when they brought it back to a repertory theater, right? Where did the music from your film come from? Uh, we we had to reference, we had to go through a lot of like uh, stock uh, sound libraries. And we really had to start, you know, we really honed in on a lot of like early 70s type, different type of genre music for movies. Um, so a lot of it was, we really went through a lot of like, you know, there's just uh, oh, and then we also have uh, a place called Soundstripe that we had a, that you if you're a filmmaker, you can get a yearly membership and they have original music. So there was the music that we used that we tried to um, uh, that we that it was more about recreating the genre of movies that we were playing to, to be accurate. And then there was the actual music that we needed for the movie that actually was a, a more original music. That was more for the emotional tone of the of some of the of the of the actual movie itself, not rep, not trying to replicate existing movies, but the actual music to our movies. And we use uh, it's like original recordings from Soundstripe, which is for you know for filmmakers to use uh, uh, current musicians that put their uh, their music up there, right? and for a fee you can use their music. So we did that. And then we also have a friend from Venezuela when we needed the Latin music for some of our scenes. We needed some Latin, original Latin music. And we had our uh, uh, a composer from Venezuela named Moro who did a fantastic job from a scene. Okay. I'm just got a small bone to pick. It's tiny, a little small. So don't get upset. You show no a problem. loony for 1972 when they didn't exist. Why? Uh, yeah, you know, that I did, th you're right. I did think of that when we put that, I just think it kind of like, uh, we were trying, I think we were just trying to say like, uh, this today's loony, this is how it would break down or whatever back then, you know, but yeah, I, I know what you're saying. Like, we're trying to say, we have a scene where we're trying to say what a dollar could get you back then mm -hmm. in 1970. We, we break it down like at a chart graph and all that. But, uh, I did think of that. Yes. I did think like, I it could have been something as simple that. Um, I don't know the loony kind of looked better. Okay, I <laughs> accept mean, that. I told you, I just it came up, so I had to make. I'm like, that's strange. Okay, how was the bus scene shot on a real bus? Uh, yeah, real, real early '70s bus uh, shot. Now, what it is we 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 got to know some people online uh, that actually work for a hair for a transit heritage company in Winnipeg. So they they really preside over like almost a museum of historical transit buses. And so they actually, when I approached them, it surprised me because I just wanted to know if they had any photos of an early 70s bus or even just some old footage or whatever. And needless to say, I was much to my happiness, I was shocked when one of them said, oh, we've got a bus from circa 1972. Uh, we can take it out for you and we can drive it around and take footage with it. And I was, and I was like, wow, I was so shocked. That, I mean, they were so generous with that. They said, yeah, I'll even dress up in an early 70s bus driver uniform. And, you know, and so I said, OK, so I actually created a shot list and I sent them a shot list. I said, if you could get this like a point of view shot of would be me going onto the bus and paying my money and, and you're dressed up in your bus driver's outfit and I walk past you. And can you like shoot all this footage from inside the bus and looking outside the bus? They unbelievable. They took the bus off for a couple of hours. And they shot all this footage as if they're like a filmmaking crew, like way beyond anything I could have dreamed of. So I'm so happy about that. And that's we we ended up using that. And it really gave that authenticity to the early. I've had people already see it and say, yeah, you know, I went on that bus in the early 70s. Where so they're they're not. In fact, when they were driving the buses through downtown to get all the shots. They had people that were trying to get on the bus and they had to stop and say, you can't get on the bus. We're actually shooting a movie right now. So it was really wild. So yes, I mean, we're very happy to get that authentic footage. Okay. You finally show up in your documentary at the eight minute mark. Right. What took you so long to show up in your documentary? 
Well, <laughs> well, I think the whole movie, I mean, in my mind, I felt like the whole movie was about me. So I already felt like I was all over that documentary. So I felt like, um, you know, because there's all there's a lot of I mean, it's about it's a it's a documentary. So it is about my experiences. Of course, we as you've seen in the documentary, we we've exaggerated and turned comical a lot of things. But those are all pictures of me and my family. When you see me growing up, those are all footage of my Super 8 movies that I made in the early 70s, uh, trying to mimic my favorite you know, genre movies like Kung Fu and action movies. So, um, but then I thought, yeah, you know, in the early seventies, they used to have some of those little um, uh, theater managers would come on or they'd have a written thing saying, hi, this is the theater, you know, the manager of the theater, please put away your garbage and all this stuff. And sometimes they'd actually have a, a person saying, hi, I'm the theater of this manager of this theater. and Welcome to the show. And remember, always be neat or whatever. Right. And don't talk or whatever. So I thought like, okay, I'm going to do something like that just to kind of actually physically be in the movie now, right? Like actually not just my photographs and my imagined version of my life, but just put myself in the movie too, just for fun. It's a kind of small part, but I just, ah, it's kind of fun. It's always fun. Like I, I do act and I have acted in film. So I just thought it was kind of fun to, to just dabble back a little bit in the acting again. So. Okay, I couldn't resist. The Swedish stewardess scene was pretty funny. Now, was nice. that shot against a green screen? Yes, that was. We we did shoot the the the, the two. We we tried to to recreate an early seventies sexy Swedish stewardess movie, which is hard to say. And uh, so again, Maria designed the costumes, and then we 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 knew what scenes, what backgrounds were going to be in the scenes. So we shot it on green screen with the proper props and everything. And then uh, we would, we, you know, found some of the backgrounds that we ended up importing and using. And then some, and then what happens, what really happened to get the majority of those backgrounds that we put into the green screen was Marie and I went to the airport here in Vancouver, knowing what we needed. And we actually went and shot stuff on, like we shot footage from the tarmac, shot it footage in the, in the airport, footage outside the airport, the radar towers, like we shot so much stuff. And then we incorporated a lot, almost, I would say most of that has been incorporated into the movie, the stuff that Marie and I went out and actually shot at the airport. I was thinking this is the movie they might have used for Taxi Driver, the Swedish Sturtis movie. Uh, yeah, I do remember what you're talking about. Yeah, when Travis is in there and it's some kind of a Swedish movie. Yes, right? so, that was just that's right. Yeah. I thought you might be doing a callback to that. So go with that. So just. Well, you know what? Yes, exactly. But I do. But it is kind of based on when I was a kid in 1972 and I did go see a movie. I remember very distinctly. Like, I don't have a great memory, but I have a great memory for all the movies I saw when I was a kid. I went to a movie. I went to see it in a, in a repertory theater. It was a rerun theater in Winnipeg in 1972. I saw a double bill of Sky Jack with Charlton Heston and Kelly's Heroes with Clint Eastwood. And. I am not kidding you. I was watching that. It was it's just a, it was for kids. Like kids could watch the movies, but they showed an X-rated trailer. This one theater for some reason. Oh, an X-rated. Yeah. yeah. So, that, so that's really the that was really it, it, that was really the inspiration for for doing that. Because in the movie, there they show it's a version of me as a nine year old going to my favorite theater, getting ready to watch this yes. movie that I want, which is for kids. Kids can come see it, but then suddenly I'm like. I can't believe my eyes when this X-rated stewardess movie trailer pops on the screen. So that's based on reality. It wasn't a stewardess movie that I saw. It was just an X-rated movie that was Swedish. And uh, I, I I still remember the name of the movie. It was called Daddy Darling. And I remember just seeing this trailer and thinking, like, I should not be seeing this. But oddly, uh, enough, oddly enough, I can't take my eyes off the screen. So now I have to ask you the question, have you ever seen Daddy Darling? No, I haven't seen it, but I did look, you know, when I was doing research for the movie, because I was even thinking originally we weren't even going to recreate all these early 70s movies. Originally, it was going to be much simpler. I was going to look for real trailers. Like I was looking, going to look for a real X-rated trailer, and, you know, and then, of course, you know, just getting the permission and the right to turn into a labyrinth. And we said, forget it. And I did look up Daddy Darling and you can go on YouTube and you can see the trailer for Daddy Darling. You can see the posters. It was like this big shocking movie about you know a, a young daughter who's probably a little too enamored with her own dad and uh so you can yeah you can see that trailer and i still remember that was the trailer that i saw that 
And that just blew my mind when I saw that as a nine-year-old. Besides Kansas City Bomber, was there another movie with Crow Welch you were thinking of for this? Um, well, if you watch the movie, I think there's some, there's some, I mean, as a kid, of course, I went and saw Fuzz, which she was in with Burt Reynolds. That was from 1972 as well. Or sorry, 73, I think. And um, so, I mean, basically, I, I, there is a, there is a, um, uh, you could see a slight homage to her Western, Hanny Calder, that she made in 1971. That's the beginning. Also, yes, and then there's also references to Fuzz, which we've changed to, like, we've changed the name. We call, like, she plays a cop, like, but in, in this homage version, it's called Policia or whatever. Yeah, so I haven't seen that one, so I couldn't pull anything out of that one. Yeah, you might keep looking for that one. I don't know if you'll find that one or not, but... Um, but anyways, yeah, so we did kind of like reference for those, you know, we referenced Fuzz as well as Hanny Calder. Those were both both referenced as well. For Raquel okay. Rose. At the end of the film, we have a nice homage to the 1980s in New York City. You say, this is my trip. You never tell us what you're doing there. Yeah, well, actually, when I went to I went to film school in the 80s, uh, as I mentioned, even in the movie. And there one one year there was a teacher strike at my at my college, so me and a friend we were in Toronto. So we said, you know what, we've always wanted to go to New York City. This was 80, 1984. So we actually went to New York City for like three days. And this was in nineteen eighty four when this is before like in Times Square. We spent all our time in Times Square. We stayed at a youth hostel or whatever there. Uh, but you know, this is when New York was Times Square, especially it was very seedy. It was not cleaned up. They could like in the early nineties. Everything they wiped out all the triple X houses and all the body shops and all that and the drug dealers and they start putting up all the Disney stores and all the shows and all that. But uh, so we did. So we went. So that's what we were there for. We just took a, like a three day hiatus and we went and just we really like hung around Times Square. We went to movies and uh, like just record shops, everything. Like we just kind of just we never we never Broadway. I even went and saw Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross when it was playing. On Broadway in its first incarnation, so we did everything around there. So that that's the that's the 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 photographs that I took that we were able to figure out a bit of a sly way to kind of incorporate that into our movie. I knew I had to put that into the movie somehow, like I figured that out. So just to help you yeah. out, I was there in 1990 and it was not cleaned up, but 1991 it was. 91, 92, it started to be cleaned up. So you're right. Because I went back in 93, and it was like, I didn't even recognize it. Everything yeah, was like, 91, 90, it, I remember looking at one way, 91. I'm like, what happened? This is not what I remember from a year ago. You're right. You walk around, and there's like M&M stores and like Nike stores everywhere. Yeah, I know. And I realized that. That was one of the reasons, too, I think I wanted to put uh, those footage, the, 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 the stills that I shot when I was in Times Square in 84 that was kind of seedy, was um, just another thing to kind of really in a way too. It's it, the film is like hopefully a loving homage to the idea of people's young people's, you know, people's memories looking back when they were young, their formative years, how much going to movies was such a powerful um, part of the life. It really helped form friendships and cemented, you know, so many different interests in life. And so it wasn't for me, like I said, in the movie, I want to show how it was. I mean, yes, it was the movies, but it was just, the independence as a young person finally to jump on a bus and go downtown and hang out and go to record stores. You know, I used to go to uh, magazine stores. I, you know, I would go to my, you know, I, you know, it was just a whole experience. Right. And um, so, and of course the movies was the biggest thing of that, but, you know, and then just, I can remember, you know, going with my friends sometimes. So, you know, just really at the end of the day, we just kind of want to say, Hey, you know, like for people having maybe the movie experiences of today, which are probably, a lot different than back then i just want to kind of say hey this is what movie going was like for for us when we were kids in the 70s right now you guys have your own experience now you know people bring their phones to movies and they can you know you know it, the movies are just different now right the, you know like the whole experience i mean it's still it's still similar in the sense that you're with an audience it gets dark something's projected on the screen and you have that communal experience that's still the same uh, but you know things have changed now right obviously you go to a movie theater now and there's like 20 screens and things like that and you know we really didn't have that for me it was just a, a multiplex. all we had was just we had a couple of double screen theaters 
but everything else was just a usually like a heritage movie theater from the 30s or something by the 70s it was still being used right like all the movie theaters i went to were theaters that had been around since the 30s or 40s right so you know of course none of those theaters are even around anymore i went back to where you see a lot of the, you know where i talk about a lot of the theaters in the movie i went back a few years ago maria and i when we were doing our last documentary and like none of those theaters are around anymore so in the movie at the very beginning or halfway through you discuss having a movie book and you cut out pictures out of the paper and you put it into a book do you still have the book no i don't have the book and it's you know like i'm always have this idea like i always say that to maria sometimes when we watch the movie after i go oh my god i wish i had it it was just basically just a store-bought scrapbook you know like uh that you would get you need for school like back in the 70s when you're a kid you had to you had an art class and you had to supply bring glue and pens and pencils and crayons and you had to have a scrapbook so it was just a scrapbook and every friday I would grab the paper because that's when they had the large size movie ads and all the movies starting that day. So the ads were bigger. Otherwise, during the week, they just had a little strip of ads that were just tiny. Right. But on a Friday, everything was expansive, like starts today or whatever. So they'd, like sometimes it'd be like a quarter of a page ad for like the Godfather or Kansas City Bomber. And I would just cut it. I would cut those ads out and I would glue them and I would just stick them in my uh, scrapbook. The scrapbooks are really oversized, too. Like they're quite big. So I could get quite a few of those in. I, I don't know how many I filled up. And I just, I stopped doing it probably when I was like 13 or something. I, I probably stopped doing it. Like, I don't know. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't losing interest in movies, but it was more like transforming it the other way. It's like, it's like, I've always loved hockey, but when I was a kid, I bought hockey cards. Right. And then there was a point where I still loved hockey, but I just didn't buy hockey cards anymore. You know what I mean? But I still loved hockey. Right. So. I do have one last question. Did your dad ever get upset you were cutting out the newspaper because before he read it? No, I no, I think I tried that once. And uh, believe me, he told me about it in a way where I thought that will not happen again. Believe me, I, my dad like he, he was. I mean, he was a great dad, but he'd be like he just had to tell me something once, and I was like, okay, like I wasn't gonna mess with my dad. So uh, I had to wait till those papers were like like definitely in the in the used pile before i could grab those things i think in the movie though i show that i'm so excited that i start cutting it out right away but yeah she do think... so that was my question yeah. yeah no i could never get away with that because my parents used to subscribe to the newspaper and believe me that like, i would never be, have have the ability to rip out that paper before they got hold of it never they, they would never let me do that okay well i've covered everything i got but you still have your fun questions and I know you remember them from last time. So you mentioned numerous old actors in the movie. Who really right. is your favorite actor? Well, you know what? I mean, now that I'm older, you know, I have this idea. I can look back and say, okay, now I have a different criteria of what acting is. But I mean, but, but if I really look at it, like from when I was a kid, I was all about movie stars. Like I didn't know, I would never really say like as a nine year old, like, yeah, that Lawrence Olivier, he's such a better actor than Charles Bronson. You know what I mean? Like, I, no, I love Charles Bronson, so he's my favorite actor. I don't care. Like, you know what I mean? I didn't, I didn't even think of him as an actor. He's just like, a, it was one of those things where it's like, you know, I see, I go to my, I go to the theater, you know, because we didn't have the internet. We didn't know about who was working on what movie in the future. I literally could be a kid just seeing a movie that I'm loving seeing. I could be going to the Poseidon Adventure in December. And as I'm sitting there, oh my God. Um, there's a trailer for a new Charles Bronson movie. When did this happen? Like, you know what I mean? Everything was like new. So I'd be locking the new coming soon, Charles Bronson in the stone killer or whatever. And I'd be like, Oh my God, like, where did that come from? And I'd just get, and I'd be like, okay, I'm staying again to the next screening. So I can see that trailer again of Charles Bronson. You know what I mean? He, so he was my favorite hundred percent actor when I grew up when I was a kid, like as a, as a male star, he was my favorite Charles Bronson. Is there one movie you still have not seen from the 70s and you've always wanted to? That is a very good question. Um, you know, they're from the 70s. I have never seen, uh, you know, it's a good, okay, like as far as I'm thinking like more like, you know what, there's a Burt Reynolds movie. It's going to be coming out on Blu-ray. I think it's from 1973 or 1974. It's called Seamus where he plays a detective. And, you know, I have never seen that. And so I, I was telling Maria, I'm just flat out buying that.
when it comes out, like on Blu-ray, because I've never seen it. But I remember seeing the trailer for it when I was a kid. I remember, and then when it opened, it was restricted, so I could never see it. And then for some reason, it's just it's one of those more obscure Burt Reynolds movies, and it's just you know it's not like Spoke, Smoking the Bandit where it's like very revered and famous. It's just one of those movies where it just doesn't pop up that much. So yeah, that I'm gonna say. Seamus by Burt Reynolds is something I like. It's a it's a detective movie from the early seventies that I'm dying to see. Well, I haven't said I see it either. So now you got it on my list to watch when it comes out. Um, the best film of last year you saw? The best film of last year. Oh boy. Um, let's see. Well, I have to say, uh, I really like Triangle of Sadness. I thought that was really good. Um. And I would say, uh, what else did I see last year that I really loved? Which I think was nominated for Oscars. But uh, oh, I really, I really liked uh, Tar. Was really good as well. That was my favorite film of the year. Was Tar. Oh wow! Wow. I love Tar. Okay, I'm gonna let you go. I always miss you when I let you go, but I'm going to. Your film is still just on the circuit. You can't find it anywhere, right? So tell everybody where they can find your other great films. Well, you can go to our YouTube. We have our YouTube channel. It's called Ross Monroe Films. It's on YouTube. And if you want to subscribe, and uh, we've got everything up there. We've got clips, interviews, uh, trailers, uh, links to how you can see. Uh, we have a feature film called A Legacy of Whining. That's on Tubi. It's on uh, Apple. It's on Amazon. Uh, so we, if you go to Ross Monroe Films, for sure, subscribe, check everything out. We'll give you all the links. You can see how you can get see all of our films. And uh, this film right now, The Movie Go, is starting to play festivals and getting some screenings. And hopefully we'll have within a year that might be up on our uh, on our uh, YouTube channel as well for everybody to enjoy. Thank you for your time and have a great evening. Thank you so much for doing this. Really appreciate it.